Good evening, everybody. So good to see you guys again tonight. Um, to, this is going to be one of our last sessions. We've got one more next week. Uh, tonight is entitled Christ's Church, a blessing to all nations. And then the next week's uh, session is called Blessed to be Part of God's Big Picture and How Did We Become Part of That Big Picture. So we are almost done. I hope you guys can hang for another two sessions. Um, this is session five, like I said, Christ's Church, a blessing to all nations. So let's dive right in. I'm going to put this, um, well, there we go. I'm going to put this on the screen for you so you can see where we're talking about today. Uh, we are talking about the Christ's church here. Now, this is after Jesus has ascended into heaven, um, but he's not come back yet. So uh, we're going to talk a lot about Paul today. We're going to touch on Philip and Peter and some of the other apostles as well. So moving right along. So, um, following the gospel's witness of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, that's, we're talking about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four gospels, um, the New Testament continues with the book of Acts. Now, this book of Acts is basically like a continuation of the book of Luke. Uh, we're fairly certain that uh, since both books are dedicated to Theophilus uh, in the very beginning uh, as a letter to them, that uh, they are written by the same author, which we, we believe to be Luke. The full name of the testimony of this early church is called the Acts of the Apostles. But as many have noted in the past, it's better described as the Acts of the Holy Spirit for he, the Holy Spirit, is the main character. Now, although Christ is no longer visibly with his church, his apostles, the ones Christ sent, are empowered by the Holy Spirit to testify about Christ to the world by the ministry of their teaching, by proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of, kingdom of God and responding to the needs according to their ability. Let's read Acts. One chapter one verses one through nine. In in the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during the forty days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, Will you do at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive by power when the witness, when, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said this, he and when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. So what two promises does Jesus give his apostles? Well, we just talked about it. He gives them, uh, they, they will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes to them, and they will be Christ's witnesses to the ends of the earth. Now, we could show how this corresponds um, with the blessing described in Galatians 3, 13, and 14. That is, the gift of the Holy Spirit and the incorporation of the Gentiles. I'm gonna, I've got my Bible right here. I didn't make a slide for this, um, but I'm going to read this to you. We're going to find Galatians chapter 3. Let's see, that's chapter 2. Chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. 
for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hang, is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Now the blessing in Acts 1, 1 through 9, we just talked about, remember? When Jesus uh, blessed them and told them about getting the Holy Spirit, the, and, and uh, Galatians 3 is about the incorporation of Gentiles into that same promise. Um, we're going to talk about Pentecost now, because uh, Pentecost is the fulfillment of that promise to the apostles in Acts chapter 1. So let's read Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly they ca there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya beginning, belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? Some, uh, it goes on to talk about how, uh, some are even saying, well, they're drunk. Uh, how can it be? Well, they're drunk, obviously. And Peter rebukes them by saying, <laughs> These men are not drunk, as you say, because it's only 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, it's great. Uh, Acts is full of some great comical elements um, that if you ever want to have a good chuckle, sometimes just read Acts. Uh, there's some good things in there that you could laugh at. Uh, Pastor Ramey has remarked on multiple occasions how we'd like to write a screenplay um, <laughs> and have it produced because there's just some outrageous things that happen in Acts. But anyway, on the day of Pentecost, the apostles receive the fulfillment of Jesus' promise as the Holy Spirit comes upon them with the visible sign of the tongues of fire. I'm going to put this picture up. I want you to see this. The visible signs of the tongues of fire. He then empowers them to speak in a variety of tongues or languages, enabling them to witness to people from every nation, as it was written in verse 5. Assembled in Jerusalem for Pentecost, all of these people were coming together, and they could hear it in their own language. Through the apostle, the Holy Spirit brings 3,000 people, 3,000 people, to repentance and the forgiveness of sins in baptism. Now, Pentecost was associated with the giving of the covenant and the commandments at Mount Sinai. And recalling that account, it is notable that God justly killed about 3,000 people who rebelled against him by worshiping the golden calf in Exodus chapter 32. Whereas in his love, the Lord blesses 3,000 people who repent on Pentecost. When the law brings death, the spirit brings life. That dichotomy, the law is death, the spirit is life. The content of the New Testament epistles or letters are too numerous for us to address point by point in this Bible study. However, in the light of the big picture, we might summarize the apostles' teaching under two headings, identity and way of life. So the identity is, who are we? Well, in John uh, 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, we are the children of God. That is our identity. And why? Well, again, in 1 John chapter 2, because Jesus is our righteousness, and he has made payment for our sins. Now, the way of life, how does this identity inform our way of life? Well, in Ephesians 2, uh, verses 8 through 10, we are saved 
by grace of by the grace of God and we respond by living for others. And how do we live in response? Well, in 1 John chapter 5 and in Matthew chapter 22, the answer is love God and love your neighbor. Peter, Paul, uh, Paul, James, John, and others address the church with regard to issues related to Christian identity and way of life. Our identity as children of God is a gift of God's love through Christ. And we are created children of God. And we live in response to this identity by loving God and loving our neighbors. When we're reading the epistles, we have to keep the big picture in mind. We should not view our Christian identity as contingent on the way we live. Rather, we should rightly see our way, our life, as the result of our God-given identity through Christ's death, life, and resurrection. Where do we find assurance of our identity? Well, that's through holy baptism and through God's word. And here's a question for you to ponder for just a moment. What are some opportunities you have to love God and love your neighbor? We're going to read some from Acts uh, about proclaiming the kingdom of God. Acts chapter 8, uh, verse 12. But when they believed Philip, as he preached good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Acts chapter 19, verse 8. And he, that is Paul, entered the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. And finally, Acts 28, 23 through 31. When they had appointed a day for him, they came to him at his lodging in great numbers. From morning till evening, he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. And some were convinced by what he said, but others disbelieved. And disagreeing among themselves, they departed after Paul had made one of, the, one of his statements. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet, Go to this people and say, You will indeed hear, but never understand. And you will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their, and their eyes they have closed lest they should see with their ears and hear with their ears. Sorry, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. He lived there two whole years. That's Paul. He, Paul lived there two whole years and had his own expense, and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God, and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. So, what is the central issue here that Philip and Paul are addressing in their discussion with others? Uh, the, they're addressing the good news of the kingdom of God, that is, that God is presently reigning, in mercy through Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. And even after Jesus ascends into heaven, the proclamation of the good news of the kingdom of God remains central to the mission of the church. Although God is not visible, or Jesus is not visible today, the risen Lord continues to bless by the forgiveness of sins those once under the curse and giving them peace and eternal life. How does the church proclaim this good news today? We proclaim it in worship services, 
specifically in the Word, Scripture readings, and in the sermon, and the sacrament, baptism, and Holy Communion, and in Christian schools, in personal conversations, and when Christians forgive each other in the name of Christ. That is how we proclaim the good news today. Jesus' followers meet the needs of others according to their ability, even as Jesus did. We see Christians share their possessions, giving to anyone as he or she has need. In addition, the apostles, empowered by the Holy Spirit, perform miraculous healings and signs. Luke, the writer of Acts, records events that reflect the ministry of Jesus in the Gospels. Let's consider Peter's visit to Tabitha by reading Acts chapter 9, verses 36 to 42. Again, that's Acts chapter 9, 36 to 42. Now, there was a man in Joppa, a disciple named Tabitha, which translated means Dorcas. She was full of good works and acts of charity. In those days, she became ill and died. And when they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, hearing that Peter was there, sent two men to him, urging him, Please come to us without delay. So Peter rose and went with them. And when he arrived, they took him to the upper room. And all the windows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other garments. The, sorry, all the widows, I don't know why I said windows, all the widows stood beside him weeping and showing tunics and other garments that Dorcas made while she was with him. But Peter put them all outside and knelt down and prayed, and turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up, and he gave her his hand and raised her up. Then calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. What similarities do you note in these two accounts of Acts 9 and Mark 5, where Jesus rose the little girl? Well, there are several um, actions that Peter does that Jesus did. Well, Peter sent the mourners out that were in the house, and then Peter goes up to the upper room where the body had been laid. Now, this miracle and the other miracles recorded in the book of Acts demonstrate that although Jesus is not visible to his people, he continues to reign, blessing his people. However, God's blessings are not always so miraculous. Notice how Tabitha met the needs of others according to her own ability, by doing good and helping the poor in response to what Christ did for her. How do we at Bethel meet the needs of our community according to our ability as a church? And I want you to really think about this because this is important. How are we serving our community? Um, I have written down a few things that um, I'm sure you guys um will be able to affirm with me that these are ways we serve the community. I want you to think of these and, and see what, uh, what you think. Blood drives. We just had one on Tuesday. Um, Helping Hands Initiative with Pastor Holler. Uh, the teacher luncheon that's coming up uh, the week of the August 20th, uh, where we're going to serve 300 teachers. Um, what other ways do we serve what other ways can we serve? Now, some of you might think pot pie. Um, I wouldn't call that necessarily a servant event because uh, although we are serving the community, it is still a fundraiser. Um, our Easter egg hunt, that's a way we serve our community. Um, the trunk or treat is another way that we serve our community. So all of these things we're doing as a community with our own abilities. And I'm sure you guys have many more examples and can um, come up with new ways that we can serve according to our, need, our abilities here at Bethel in the Oxford Catfish community. We have to be witnesses to all the nations. And not only did 
people from all ends of the earth hear about the good news of Jesus at Pentecost. The word continues to spread through the world to this very day. There are still people on planet earth that have never heard about Jesus. Can you imagine never hearing about Jesus? But at a glance, Paul's missionary journeys illustrate how God can make his blessings flow as far as the curse is found. In addition, we see that the Lord is faithful to his promise to Abraham. The blessing of Christ is for all nations. Um, I want to read to you uh, Romans chapter 15, verses 17 through 29. But before I do, I want to just put this up on the screen for you, this map, because um, I want you to see Paul's missionary journey. He went on three missionary journeys, um, and each missionary journey on this map has a different um, line that you could trace. Um, I want to just put this up for you to see. Uh, there are tons of places that he went all over Asia Minor here and down into Africa, uh, uh, almost into Africa. There's modern day, well, there's Syria. I don't know if it's a modern day, but there's Syria. Pamphylia, Phrygia, remember Lydia, uh, all those name places that we heard in the beginning of Acts are all mentioned, are all places right here. I'd like to read to you uh, uh, Romans 15, 17 through 29. In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God, for I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me, to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ, and thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation, but as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. This is the reason why I have so often been hindered from coming to you, but now, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, and since I have longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain, and to be helped on my journey there by you, once I have enjoyed your company for a while. At present, however, I am going to Jerusalem, bringing aid to the saints, for in Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem, for they were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings, they ought to have be of service to them in their material blessings. When therefore I have completed this, and have delivered to them what has been collected, I will leave for Spain by way of you. I know that when I come to you, I will be, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. So what was Paul's ambition? Well, his amb ambition was to preach the gospel where Christ was not shown. Um, we could go back to that map again and, and look at the different places, but I kind of showed you that. Um, all of those regions there are in Asia Minor. Now, we don't have to travel far to or to a different nation to be a witness for Christ. Is there someone in your life who does not know Jesus? Take a minute. I want you to think about this because I want you to share the gospel with somebody this week. Is there someone in your life who doesn't know Jesus? And how does the church share the blessings of God? Well, through Jesus, who has come through the, through the Jews, all nations receive the blessing that overcome the curse. 
the Gentile churches share material blessings with Jews during a famine. Note how the church works together globally, proclaiming the good news and meeting needs according to ability. Let's have a word of prayer. Almighty, merciful Father, you have established your church to be a blessing to the nations. For the sake of Christ, forgive us when we are distracted from our mission and enable us to bear witness to your love in Christ to those in our lives so that your name might be glorified forever. In Christ's name we pray. Amen and amen. All right, next week is our final session on the Big Picture Bible Study. We are going to start back um, the week after Labor Day on Tuesday, I believe that's September 11th, 7 o'clock. Uh, we're going to pick up with the book of Matthew. These are going to be short 30-minute studies, um, so I hope you'll come back for that. Uh, we're going to go verse by verse, Matthew 1, 1, all the way to the end of chapter uh, twenty. Eight, I believe. Uh, regardless, I hope you guys have a great week and a great evening, and I hope to see you back next Thursday for our final big picture Bible study. God bless you. Have a great evening. Bye-bye.